Um, I was going to say, the first thing I was going to say this morning was, my name's Tim Wright, I work for a company called Twin Tangibles, and I'm a management consultant, and I thought that that was going to get me a few boos. But I think I trumped it earlier on, because I put my hand up on the Brexit thing. So yes, if you're thinking, is that the guy? Yeah, that's me. What I want to talk to you about this morning, though, is uh, the crowd economy. We're getting some great presentations this morning, um, which are really informative and very encouraging. And clearly, we are amongst a group of people who really understand the dynamics and the opportunity available. But I want to paint a slightly less than rosy picture, um, because I think it's worth doing, and I think it's something that we should be concerned about. So to get a little bit of interaction going first up, does anybody know who this man is? Anybody in the audience can tell me who this man is? Anybody? Anyone? Don't be shy. No? No? OK. This guy is Don Tapscott. Don uh, wrote Wikinomics, and he's a Canadian. So there's another Canadian link coming up here. Uh, and a guy that really set out some of the opportunities that are available for us in the crowd economy. And what was particular about his approach was he was pointing out that this is available to us if we look externally. We look external from the organization. So the source of value sat outside. And that challenged a lot of uh, conventional thinking. And if you've read Wikinomics, you'll know he's got some great examples in there of case studies which indicate taking novel approaches, but certainly attracted their assets from external to the organization. Another guy I wanted to reference is this guy. Now, I've kind of given you the answer to the question on this one. Uh, this guy is Yoki Benkler. He's a professor at Yale. And Yoki did some great work around the idea of looking at different motivations for people to become engaged with value-creating activities. And he pointed up through his work with Kosis Penguin and this particular book, Penguin and the Leviathan, that in actual fact, we can identify new and novel mechanisms of people wanting to create value, which go against much of the thinking that had informed a lot of our business practices to that point. So between the two of them, they set out two interesting counterintuitive dimensions to what I refer to as the crowd economy. And we can include in that all sorts of things, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, collaborative con uh, consumption, open innovation, open source. These are all examples of things that I would place within the crowd economy. But I like to think of it as rather than being siloized into these things, as being a meld and mix of them. And that they demonstrate certain aspects of what both Don and Yoki pointed up. And we can point to some fantastic examples in that space. So we can think of Linux. Yeah, penguins, Linux. Okay, And the, the, probably the best photo bomb in the world ever. Uh, you know, that's, that's a piece of software so widely used, underpinning most of our, our key uh, technical systems. Would have cost about $12 billion to produce had it been done in a conventional way. Uber. OK, so Uber's already been mentioned, disrupting the taxi and ride, ride business enormously valued at around $40 billion and until very recently didn't own a single car. So novel models. Uh, anybody guess what that one is? Spot on, Airbnb, yes. So uh, Airbnb, another example, 37 million uh, user nights a year, growing very, very rapidly. And a again, a fantastic example of novel uh, and innovative thinking. Again, my good friend Amy Cortez pointed up that our ability now to actually direct our funds locally and disintermediate that process is fantastically powerful. And that you know, if, if in the United States the adult population released just 1% uh, of their uh, uh, long-term investments, that would be about a $260 billion fund. But not everything is great. You know, we, 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 we can point to these great examples, but we're starting to run into problems. So those examples, Uber and Airbnb, are already starting to run into regulatory challenges that mean they might end up somewhere like this. A lot of the crowdsourcing that we come across seems to me to be based on the rather uh, unintelligent, if you will, or the, or the least exciting aspect of crowdsourcing, and founded in this idea that you have an unlimited number of monkeys and an unlimited number of typewriters, and given enough time, you'll get the complete works of Shakespeare or probably Goethe, if we uh, to, to localize it a little. Um, and we've got in the crowd finance space, lots and lots of people coming forward as crowd funders, 
and presenting themselves as crowdfunding platforms, and they're just masquerading as that. They are simply not crowdfunders. They just happen to be the usual suspects, the people that constrain the access to those, those resources and activities in the past, just transacting online. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it isn't crowdfunding. And if it isn't crowdfunding, it doesn't bring all of the additional value and all of the additional benefits that crowd finance can bring. And much of what we see in the alternative finance space, to my mind, looks very much like the age-old way things have been done, just being done digitally. Now, as I say, these things aren't necessarily bad. If they scale up access to finance and allow us to disrupt the organizations, and Julia Groves, who I fell out with a little bit earlier on, um, was right in many things. We don't like banks in the UK very much. But if we can disrupt them a little bit through these alternative finance spaces, great. But are they genuinely crowd-enabled and crowd-asset-driven opportunities? And if they're not, have we got the, the, uh, the opportunity to reach out to them? And I have to ask the question, should we be worried about this? Should it concern us if these things presenting themselves as crowdfunding are not crowdfunding, if we're not making the best use of the opportunity available? Well, I think we should for a number of reasons. One is the crowd is such an enormous and continually growing asset. But I also think that we should look at history and think about some of the things that have happened in the past. And we were encouraged to talk about our own personal stories. So my personal story is about 30 years ago, I was very involved with the knowledge management agenda. And knowledge management was presented as an entirely transformative model, completely changing the way we think about management, the way that we liberate all of the intellectual property and intellectual assets that exist within our organization to make better decisions, quicker decisions, more economically viable decisions, and have a more equitable share and recognition of the contributions that go in into that. Great. I loved it. It was fantastic. But unfortunately, it rapidly descended into something like this. So you had all of these ideas where we were trying to suck information out of people's minds and put it in repositories and nonsense around trying to drive tacit to explicit. Philosophical hogwash. It was great if you happened to be selling a very tired database system because you could rebadge it as a knowledge base. And it meant you shifted a hell of a lot more units. And my concern is if we don't address the reality of what makes the crowd economy and crowd aspects distinctive, we run the risk of ending up here and having the same outcome as knowledge management has. And frankly, I don't believe knowledge management has delivered anything particularly significant in the time that it's been around. You can point at some good examples of people collaborating more effectively, a little bit more inclusive decision making, a little bit of innovation. But is it the transformative opportunity that it was painted to be? No, I don't think it was. So I guess we have to ask why these things happen and what we can do to try and avoid them. What is it that's causing this tendency to not take, make the most of these opportunities? Well, I think there's a whole range of things. I think that our management ideas and a lot of our regulatory ideas, and we've mentioned that already this morning, our monetization models are all uh, somewhat constrained. And we have habits to fall back into our original way of thinking. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier to do stuff as we've done them in the past. Doing crowd-based stuff isn't easy. It takes new competencies new approaches and new understanding. And the reason I've got this one there, this is the, the manager. I think many of our management models are somewhat archaic. If you look at the origins of the word, have we any Italians in here today? Any Italian people? Yes, jolly good. Buongiorno. Um, the, uh, the word management actually is an Italian word by origin, and it's about riding a horse. And if you've ever ridden a horse, you'll know that there's an awful lot of two-way negotiation that goes on here. It's not any kind of mechanistic process. I think a lot of our regulatory models are actually designed to constrain rather than enable. I think a lot of them are now owned and captured by lobbyists and big businesses to actually protect their situation, protect their circumstance, and not actually enable or allow new models to come forward. And I think a lot of our business practices are, um, well, I, I, I leave it to that. That kind of speaks volumes, as they say. So 
what can be done about it? Well, I want to share with you a framework. I did say I'm a management consultant. I promise there's only one framework, so uh, don't, don't hate me. This is a framework that we use a uh, bit that sort of harks back to those, those, two, those two people I mentioned right at the start, so uh, Don and Yoki. We use this as a way of mapping some of the different dynamics that exist within the, the crowd economy. So on one axis, we've got the, the changing nature of the relationship, where we go from at one corner a very, very traditional, highly managed, contractual type model, to the other end where it's entirely based on trust. We have no control at all. And then, of course, on the other axis, we've got this idea of where is the value existing in the crowd? Is it the crowd as a whole? Or is it maybe an individual that happens to be somewhere outside there in the crowd, and obviously everywhere in between? And you can map this out as, as wide as you want. You could actually pull big data into this. But it's intended to help people understand the different dynamics that exist within the, the crowd economy. And if you want to, you can start mapping things onto this framework. You can actually take crowdfunding, for example, and map the different models of crowdfunding onto it as well. But it's, it's a kind of intended to be a bit of a blank sheet to help explain and help people navigate their way into the crowd economy. And I think us, as the experts in this space, have a responsibility to start populating this type of map and dropping onto it all sorts of new competencies. Because I think lots of our management, regulation, valuation, and commercialization models tend to drive us towards a specific outcome. And we're busy, and we're challenged enough to take that easy option. And I think we need to start turning all of these things on its head and driving us in the other way. And of course, like all good management consultancy frameworks, you want to be in the, the top right. I mean, that, that is a given. So what we, I think we should do collectively in an engaged and crowd-sourced way is start to plot on here some of the competencies and skills and approaches and different thinking that are necessary to operate in these different places and use this to make it more feasible and easier for all businesses to take the approach to adopting the crowd asset economy. And importantly, to help our regulators to understand the implications of what they do from a regulatory standpoint. So this today is an appeal to you all to join with me as part of a loose team, not too loose, otherwise you might fall off the motorbike and give everybody uh, an evolving model that helps them get access to crowd assets and make sure that we do not lose the crowd economy opportunity in the same way that we've used some, lose some of these uh, transformational opportunities in the past. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.